and um, you're very welcome here um, this afternoon. Uh, so President McRae, our visitors to DCU from Alltech, the IDA, Enterprise Ireland, Science Foundation Ireland and, and Dublin City Council and of course our colleagues here in, within, uh, in DCU, you're very welcome uh, to this inaugural lecture by Professor Richard Murphy. Um, my name is Donald O'Gorman, I'm the Interim Director of the National Institute for Cellular Biotechnology and it's my pleasure to host uh, the event here today. Uh, Professor Murphy has been um, an invaluable resource and help to us in, in the National Institute of Cellular Biotechnology over the last number of years. He chairs the Board of Management of the Institute and he's provided invaluable guidance around the organisation and management of the Institute as well as insights into the priorities linking industry and academic partnerships. Um, this has led to a number of very successful collaborations in DCU within the NICB, uh, work with uh, Dr. Finborough Sullivan, Martin Klein, Professor Martin Kleins, has led to the development of novel models uh, that, that have recently been published. Um, and again, recognize, this has been recognized as a very good example of industry academic partnerships by many outside of DCU, including the, the CEO of the Food Safety Authority of Ireland. In addition, Dr. Karina Horgan as well from Alltech is, is also leading a number of other collaborations with uh, colleagues in DCU, um, in the school, with, with colleagues in the School of Chemical Sciences, Blonde White and April Stalkup, and within the School of Biotechnology uh, with Dermot Walls as well, indicating a broad range of collaboration um, across the DCU campus. Therefore, it's very fitting that Professor Murphy be appointed as an adjunct professor uh, by DCU and we very much look forward to an engaging presentation and also <coughs> continued collaboration as well. Before I conclude, I have to thank um, especially Maria Callan and Emer Walsh who have done Trojan work to organise the event uh, today. And I now hand over to the DCU President, uh, Professor Brie McGray, to introduce the lecture. Thank you. Friends, colleagues, uh, and especially visitors to DCU, you're all very welcome here this afternoon uh, for this uh, lecture from adjunct professor, P Professor Richard Murphy. Um, I really want to welcome guests from Alltech itself. I know there's some Alltechians, as they call themselves in the audience. You're very welcome but also colleagues from IDA and from Science Foundation Ireland and in particular from Enterprise Ireland because I know Enterprise Ireland is supporting this relationship very strongly and we very much welcome that. Just to explain to those of you who may not know, um, the term adjunct professor really it's, um, refers to someone who is operating at professorial level, uh, although they may not be going through the traditional academic pathway, but it is a professorial level, so there's a clear recognition of quality and standard. An adjunct means that just that they're actively working with the university itself, and it's a means for us as a university of recognizing that level of expertise that is being shared with us. Now, it's usually bilateral, but it's not a cosmetic award. It's a real award for people doing real things to enable the university to advance itself, and I think that's, I'm very happy to call out, uh, uh, and I think we'll witness that from the presentation to, to, to follow uh, from, from Richard. Uh, the, the NICB itself is renowned for its work on cell and molecular biology research in Ireland, and that's no surprise to most of you here, in particular uh, as it interacts with clinical translational research in the cancer, diabetes and ocular disease areas and some significant successes in that, but also with the biopharma and other biosciences related industries. And one such industry is Alltech itself, where Richard is research director at the fantastic European Bioscience Centre in Dunboyne. And I think anybody who's ever gone out there will, will be hugely impressed by the facil facilities themselves and what emerges from them. Like myself, Richard is a graduate of NUI Galway, but despite that huge handicap, um, he has, has managed to flourish in his career. Um, he completed his degree there in biochemistry, and following graduation, Richard received a research scholarship from Alltech, and that theme will emerge again, and earned his doctorate in the Department of Biochemistry in NUI Galway which is a really strong department, just to be very clear. And since then, his career at Alltech has gone from strength to strength. Uh, and we were very pleased, and certainly I was very pleased to come on through, and Martin had flagged it to me that the um, proposal for an adjunct professorship came to us. And it comes to the highest levels in the university, and it gets approved at governing authority. And, um, and that happened uh, in 2016 through the Faculty of Science and Health. 
As Ireland's University of Enterprise, DCU prides itself in its deep engagement with the enterprise sector itself. And we've particularly strong linkages with, with all tech. And I think the work here you'll hear today reflects that. But also as a manifestation of that in 2015, I was delighted that we were able to honour the founder of Alltech, uh, Dr. Pierce Lyons, with an honorary doctorate. Um, Dr. Lyons established Alltech in his garage in Kentucky in 1980, and he told me this a number of times, with starting capital of $10,000. Okay, and as he says himself, a little bit of knowledge about yeast. Um, the, the company now has annual sales of over $1 billion, and really they're one of the small number of leading animal health and nutrition companies in the world. And I think, Richard, I, th I think the last figure I saw was like 130 different countries around the world has um, all tech presence in one or another in terms of markets and so on. So it's an incredible success story from an Irish scientist from Dundalk, I have to note to you, uh, an Irish scientist with deep knowledge of a particular area and having an entrepreneurial spirit and making something hugely significant in, in the world. Alltech has given generously to universities around the world, and it's a badge of honour when one establishes a partnership with Alltech, and we're delighted that DCU has that. And Alltech has contributed to postgraduate students studying for their PhD, and the, the support has launched quite a number of successful careers of many scientists, including, <coughs> including of course, Richard himself. As mentioned uh, by Donald, the, Richard has made significant contributions to DCU in different ways. He's chair of the board of management of the NICB and is highly regarded for his industry uh, perspective in that context and really has added hugely to the strategic direction of the institute itself. But I've also engaged with Richard in other areas and he was, uh, I think you chaired the quality review process for the School of Chemical Sciences and played a significant role in that providing, again, valuable advice uh, for shaping the future direction of the school itself. In addition to his leadership roles, he's also an active researcher and collaborates on a number of projects with DCU, and that's what you're going to hear, hear about today. Uh, I won't say too much about that and leave that to Richard, but just significantly, a recent publication of Richard's in the World <coughs> Journal of Gastroenterology in collaboration with, with Finbar O'Sullivan here and others at NICB was the first to use triomics, and, and you all know what that means, but quite complex and significant technology and interpretation to investigate the function of intestinal cell lines. The study identified 34 proteins undergoing microRNA a translational repression and has opened a number of opportunities for further research. This industry academic collaboration between Alltech and NICB and SCB at DCU is supported not only by Alltech itself but by Enterprise Ireland under the Innovation Partnership Scheme as part of the national strategy. And the, the NSAB Alltech partnership proposal was initiated with the primary goal of examining how intestinal cells process trace minerals. And really, that's, that's where, the, where the key innovations are happening. And really, it's a casting and shining a light on allowing us to achieve greater understanding of the regulation of mineral levels, the impact of manipula manipulating these levels in mammalian tissues, and whether this is influenced by the type of mineral itself. So I think that's a, a quite significant, but that's the basis of what we're going to hear about now. But anyway, you've heard quite enough from me. It's, the university is delighted to welcome um, Richard into the fold with us as adjunct professor, and are very grateful to Richard and to Alltech for the very deep and productive relationship with the university through an ICB. So without further ado, can I... I Welcome, Richard, to deliver his uh, inaugural lecture in this regard. Thank you. Um, thank you, President. Uh, thank you, Donald. And, and uh, thanks to everybody here today. I'm deeply honoured to have uh, received the title of adjunct from Dublin City University. Over the last number of years, I've made some, some great friends and some great collaborators. Um, and I think the work itself is, is, is quite special. Um, as uh, Professor uh, uh, McCraig said, uh, the paper from uh, Finbar and from NICB um, that was published just recently is the first um, to ever mention the use of the word triomics in the title, uh, or first to use that type of strategy um, in terms of trying to understand uh, cellular processes involved in, in mineral uptake and mineral metabolism. So it's great to be part of a, a, a world-first paper, a world-first group, to be honest. 
Um, uh, my talk today just wants to look at a couple of the different projects that we've got ongoing with Dublin City University. Um, so there, these are with different researchers and different research groups within uh, the university itself. So uh, Professor April Stalkup, uh, and Dermot Walls, Blonnet White, and Martin Kleins and the entire NICB team got a, a very diverse talk, but they all have one common, uh, I guess, uh, theme with them is the area of what I would call molecular malnutrition. Um, so just very, very quickly, uh, how many people here take uh, trace element and, and vitamin supplements? Yeah, just want to put your hands up. So, so quite a few of you. Uh, you might think differently about that this afternoon after I'm finished. <laughs> um, just to make one other quick comment on this. So where we're coming from with Alltech, uh, we're working with poultry, with livestock, with animals. It's actually much more difficult to sell trace element and mineral products for animal uh, feed and animal production than it is for uh, human nutrition. So you can walk up to Holland and Barrett, you can buy 30, 40 different types of trace element and mineral uh, and supplement. They're not regulated. Um, whereas in the animal industry, because it's going directly into um, the food production system, uh, it's much, much more tightly regulated. Um, and I think some of the data that we've generated here at DCU really shows that the care that needs to be taken when looking at the type of trace elements, type of, of mineral supplement that you're taking yourself. Um, I came across this a couple of weeks back. It's a, quite a nice quote from William Campbell, who's uh, a Nobel laureate from Ireland. He worked on ivermectin, um, which basically controls um, parasites, controls a, a, a roundworm. Um, he talks a lot about chance and how chance plays, played a big part in his career, uh, how chance played a big part in the development of uh, ivermectin. Um, and certainly when I think about chance and, and uh, its role in my career, uh, it really was just a chance discussion with uh, Professor Martin Kleins from NICB a number of years back where we were looking for um, advice and help in setting up tissue culture facilities in Alltech that led to, uh, I guess, the, the much larger collaboration that we have with the university uh, um, today. So certainly uh, it's always good to take a chance in science. Um, it's always good to take a, a, a chance um, with collaborators as well. It's, it's worked out very well for us. For people who don't know uh, about Alltech, um, we are, uh, as uh, President McCrae said, uh, one of the leading animal feed um, and animal nutrition companies worldwide. We've got a presence um, in about 120, 130 countries. We have offices everywhere, um, and we really have about two and a half thousand employees at this stage. Um, in Ireland, we've got 120 people on site. And we have a team of 20 in research that um, I oversee, uh, and certainly um, as the European headquarters, it's great to be able to collaborate um, with Dublin City University. Um, we have what we call an ACE principle, um, where we're trying to increase not only the performance of the animal, but we're looking to benefit you as a consumer of those uh, meat, milk and egg products. And ultimately, uh, we do have uh, a Part of our mission is that the products that we produce, the manner in which we produce them, are safe for the environment. So certainly sustainability is a big part of our mission. Worldwide we have about 150 scientists um, that's split between three different arms. So we've got our uh, more applied uh, research, um, which in the context of Alltech refers to um, animal work that we would uh, be involved with. So these would be demonstration studies um, and with uh, poultry, with livestock uh, and so on. We have a much more basic and fundamental research program, which is where the team in Dunboyne comes in. We're involved in trying to understand how the products work um, rather than um, how they'll work in the animal. And then we also have a process development um, division as well. In terms of our uh, collaboration with Dublin City University, um, we've been based in Dublin now since about 1999. Uh, originally, we had research facilities in Galway. Um, in 1999, we opened our facility in Dunboyne and we moved from Galway, so we came from the west to the east coast. Um, it was quite a change coming from, from, from Galway to Dublin, um, Galway being a, a party town and um, NUI Galway being a party university uh, was much, much different when we came here. Um, but we quite quickly um, started into collaborating with local universities. We've been taking on intra placements from Dublin City University now um, since, I guess, around about 2000. Um, at the moment, we also have four PhD students on site, um, Ali Coyle, um, Charles O'Doherty, um, Sarah Lynch, and Asmita starting next year as well. Um, so we, we really are beginning to get more and more embedded, I think, with, with Dublin City University. Um, we also have a, 
uh, an Irish Research Council uh, collaboration with Professor Stalkup over in uh, Chemical Sciences. So one of our um, staff members, Patrick Ward, got the opportunity to do a, a PhD um, with Chemical Sciences and he'll have his Viva um, next January. So it's been a, quite a wide and varied uh, um, programme. Uh, and then the last area I think is our probably our biggest um, research programme in Ireland. It's the uh, research alliance that we have with um, um, Donal and with Martin in NICB, um, and which basically has received um, Enterprise Ireland funding, so we have an innovation uh, partnership um, with the NICB, and we're looking at the area of minerals and mineral metabolism. So you can see it's a, quite a big collaboration. In fact, it's our biggest collaboration with any of the Irish universities and even any of the UK-based universities uh, um, um, it, that we have. So I'm going to split my talk up into, I guess, two key areas of research for us. First of these is on the area of, of selenium, and the second area then will be on, on copper. Um, selenium is quite an interesting element. Um, for years, I think one of the biggest, um, most interesting facets of it was that it was regarded as a toxic element. It was really only shown to be an essential trace element around 1957. But importantly now, it's very well documented as one of the key regulators of antioxidant systems cellularly. So it's not just in, in animals, but also in, in humans. Uh, certainly I find it a, a very, very strange but very, very interesting element to work with. And um, such are the differences that we have seen with uh, the different forms of uh, selenium that we can uh, take in our diets. Um, these are just some examples of, of proteins that selenium is involved in. It has an absolute um, essentiality for their function. So the glutathione peroxidase is tyrodoxin reductase, for instance. These are all very well documented components of the cellular antioxidant system. And when you see the amount of uh, um, cellular processes that selenium is not just involved in, but also regulates, uh, you begin to appreciate the importance of selenium um, as an element and as a, a nutrient. Typically, when we talk about um, nutritional sources or supplemental sources of selenium, you're really limited to about four different forms. So you've got sodium selenite, sodium selenate, you've got uh, chemically synthesized L-selenomethionine, or you have the bottom one, which is uh, what Alltech is interested in, it's uh, selenium yeast. And certainly, um, what I'll show you over the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so is that depending on the form of selenium that you're taking in your diet, you can have very, very dramatic and very, very different effects in terms of the cellular outcomes that those supplemental sources um, can have. And I think perhaps most of the interest in selenium came about after Larry Clark's paper in, in, in 1996. That's the one on the left here. Um, and again, when we talk about chance, it was a chance discovery by um, Larry Clark's group that led to a much more greater interest in selenium as having anti-cancer uh, and benefits. So Clark's group set out to show if supplemental selenium in the diet had an effect on um, um, skin cancer. They actually didn't see any benefit in terms of uh, uh, reducing skin cancers, but they saw significant benefits in terms of reducing prostate cancer, um, 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 cancer of the liver, uh, kidney cancer, and so on. So quite a chance discovery by Clark's group led to a, a very significant uh, increase in interest in uh, um, selenium as an anti-cancer or as a preventative. A subsequent follow-on study called um, SELECT uh, which was based on the initial Clark study, again took a chance and they looked at using chemically synthesized selenomethionine instead of selenium yeast, which had been originally used in the Clark study. Now, the feeling at the time was that selenomethionine was the major component or the major storage form of selenium in the yeast. It was automatically assumed to be the uh, um, element or the form of selenium which was most beneficial. In fact, the select study could probably be described as a disaster, whereby they looked at uh, selenomethionine, free selenomethionine with vitamin E, but what they actually saw was an increase in the rate of prostate cancer in male subjects um, in the trial. Um, so that, that study was quickly abandoned. There was a lot of, 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 I guess, negative press about selenium after that. So you can see here the role of how chance really does, can significantly influence research and research direction. And I think. When you look at the LD50s, or when you look at the toxicity data comparing selenium yeast with um, either sodium selenite, or you can see here with the selenium assigning, you can appreciate that there are distinct differences. So when you look at selenium yeast, the toxicity of that is about 250-fold less than the free selenium assigning, which was used in the uh, um, SELECT study. And certainly the bottom molecule here, I'm not going to talk a little bit about it, uh, but there are parallels with what we're doing on the copper side. 
and that the parent compound for this material here is also a parent compound for one of the copper products that we we're working with, with uh, um, Martin's group at the NICB. Certainly you can see distinct differences in the toxicity from these molecules. Uh, all of these are, are, are you would think, are, are fairly innocuous, uh, but certainly when you look at the toxicity data, you can see that there are distinct differences between them. So my advice to anybody who's taken a selenium supplement, stay away from selling methionine, take a good selenium yeast product. Um, with selenium yeast, it's quite an interesting process. Uh, you're actually tricking yeast to take up selenium in place of sulfur. So sulfur and selenium are quite chemically similar, uh, and you can manufacture uh, selenium derivatives of sulfur amino acids like methionine and cysteine in a low sulfur environment. And it's a very, very simple process. Um, one of the difficulties is because it's so simple, there are many different products on the marketplace. So Waltec is not the only company that has a selenium yeast product. Um, and certainly, I think the common misconception in the feed industry and also in the uh, uh, supplement industry is that, well, these are all yeast products. They must all be the same. How could there be, uh, how could there be any difference between them? Uh, and certainly, we've spent the last number of years, um, and in fact, probably about 10 or 11 years, coming up with a way in which we can compare and contrast different selenium yeast products and understand how they um, influence not just antioxidant processes, but overall cellular health um, at a, a much more molecular level. And that's where, I guess, our, our collaboration with, with DCU um, really has kicked off. I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but um, if you look at these three different selenium yeast products here, they all handle and they all deposit selenium differently into different cellular fractions. So if you were to say this product was the same as this, you'd be very much mistaken. Um, and that's one of the key areas for us, is to try and understand differences between not just different selenium sources, but different selenium yeast products. Um, we, we've had some, I guess, one of the biggest aids to us, and one of the biggest aids to science as a whole, has been um, really very rapid advancements in speciation technologies. So 10 or 15 years ago, you're really limited to quite simple uh, and crude and rudimentary techniques to understand the different makeup of selenium compounds that are present. Uh, and certainly, if I was to put this slide up in January of this year, I would have just said greater than 60 identified to date. But um, with the help of uh, uh, Professor Salk up here in the Irish Research Council, um, Patrick Ward has just submitted a thesis whereby he's looking at different uh, selenine compounds or the selenine metabolite in uh, water extracts of, of different selenium yeast products. And he's identified 153 or over 150 new selenine metabolites which haven't previously been described. So that work has been, has been done at DCU here. It's, it's uh, quite a novel area and certainly what the um, implications of that are, are quite unknown at present, but when you look at the impact that selenium yeast had in the original Clark study, you would hope that there are some benefits, um, or at least some of these metabolites uh, are involved in the anti-cancer properties noted in that original study. Patrick's done some, some quite nice elemental uh, um, composition analysis of these using um, ESI QTOF, and we've just listed here a couple of them. Um, the, these are all previously undescribed compounds, um, but one thing that is noticeable is that when you compare the elemental composition of the different selenium yeast products, there are significant differences between them. So to say that this product here is the same as this, simply because the yeast product really doesn't begin to look at the differences that exist at a, a metabolite level. Um, again, it's, it, it, it's back to the issue of chance. And a number of years back, if anybody remembers with the Fukushima um, um, reactor uh, issue in Japan, uh, we started to get interested in, I guess, the uh, um, um, radiation protective effects of selenium. Um, it was a, a side project at the time, but it certainly led into something uh, uh, quite different. And I think this is a great quote from, from um, Erwin Chargaff, in that really when we started to drill down and look at the differences that exist between these forms of selenium, we really didn't begin to, uh, I guess, uh, um, or even start to think about what we would find, and that's certainly is something that uh, has been um, um, led uh, by a team here in DCU. So, um, Blonnet and, and Dermot and Sarah Lynch have done some great work with us in looking at different selenium yeast products and understanding uh, their impact. 
This is some older work, um, so we had initially looked at just comparing sodium selenite with selenium yeast. This just looks at the impact of those different forms of that same tra trace element on DNA damage. And you can see in the top panel here, regardless of the uh, um, selenium concentration, and this is in a HEP G2 uh, uh, um, model looking at lead-induced DNA damage, regardless of the concentration of sodium selenite, you always got not just uh, uh, the lead effect, but the sodium selenite itself had a DNA damaging effect. Bottom panel here is selenium yeast product at Alltech manufacturers, and you can see a distinct benefit to using sodium, or distinct benefit to using the selenium yeast over the sodium selenite in terms of a reduction in DNA damage in this system. So uh, challenging cells, in this case liver cells, with lead to induce DNA damage, you get a, 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 preve a preventative effect with the selenium yeast but you get uh, an additive effect with sodium selenite. So again, always look carefully at the uh, box of trace elements that you're getting. You might be getting more uh, um, bang for your buck than you think. When we drill down a little bit into it, and this made a, quite a nice paper a number of years back, when we tried to understand what was happening at a transcriptomic level, any of the pathways that we looked at were all completely divergently impacted. So uh, sodium selenite, always exacerbated, always upregulated pathways associated with DNA damage. So in this case here, it's an ATM signaling pathway. And you can see with the selenium yeast, you get a distinct decrease in the expression of markers that are associated with DNA damage. So as well as the actual physical effects, you can see at a transcriptomic level, a complete divergence between selenium source. And in fact, we looked at multiple pathways. It was the same uh, regardless of the pathway that we uh, assessed. In this case here, it's a double-strand break repair by homologous uh, recombination. Again, quite divergent in terms of the impact of sodium selenite uh, on the left-hand side versus uh, selenium yeast on the right-hand side. And the same again, I'm not going to go into these, but any of the pathways that we looked at in terms of uh, induction of DNA damage, all of them were completely divergently uh, um, affected whether it was uh, between um, sodium selenite and between selenium yeast. You got that increase in expression as a marker of, of increased DNA damage and a decrease uh, with the selenium yeast. Um, all well and good to have transcriptomic data, uh, but certainly as, uh, as a Shargaff, he's a great man for the quotes actually. <laughs> um, molecular biology really is, I guess it's essentially the practice of biochemistry without a license. <laughs> Apologies to any uh, pure molecular biologists in the audience. I'll always remain a biochemist. Um, it's all well and good to have transcriptomic data, but you really need to begin to drill down into it and look at the proteomic end of it, or in fact look at the actual uh, physical outcomes um, within the cell. And this is, uh, I guess, some work that we had done before uh, um, Sarah Lynch came on board to uh, um, work with us in, in terms of, of, of doing a PhD here at, at DCU. This is a simple cell-based model, again, in liver, and just looking uh, very quickly at a couple of different selenium yeast products and showing, in this case here, there are distinct differences between those selenium yeast products. So we know that we have, now at least we know that we have different uh, cellular metabolome in those yeast products. That those differences in the cell and metabolome are, are quite linked, uh, I think, to how the cells can handle oxidative stress. And in this case here, it's uh, their ability to neutralize a hydrogen peroxide uh, uh, um, challenge. And Sarah's done some, some great work here with, with, with Dermot and Blonnet. Uh, in this case here, I've just given two quick results uh, um, from Sarah's PhD, where she's looking at uh, at the, on the top panel, it's uh, glutathione peroxidase activity, and the bottom, it's, it's tyrodoxin reductase. And you can see that depending on the source of the selenium that's used, you can have a much distinctly different uh, impact. Um, not only do you have an impact in terms of the activity of these enzymes, but uh, quite quickly when you look at the uh, tyrodoxin reductase activity on the bottom, there are distinct differences noted in the ability of different yeast preparations even to regulate or increase the activity uh, at a proteomic level. And in some cases, the selenium source does prove detrimental. So you can see with the sodium selenite, and you can see with the selenothionine, compared to control, you get a decrease not only in uh, uh, um, the ability or the activity of the tyrodoxin reductase, but under challenge conditions, and in this case here it's with cadmium, you get an even greater effect. So um, an additive decrease, if you like, in terms of the ability of the cells to handle uh, heavy metal challenge. 
She's also been able to uh, um, demonstrate this uh, in terms of the ability of, of different selenium yeast products um, to not only prevent DNA damage, but my more recent work, and I think this is extremely exciting work, is that there is a differential ability of these products to actually enhance DNA repair mechanisms. So those slides that I showed earlier, um, where we looked at the transcriptomic impact of sodium selenide versus uh, um, um, selenium yeast, you can see that um, there are physical benefits to uh, um, that as well. Now we tried to make a I guess, or try to understand what the difference is between a selenium yeast product. So remember, we're adding this as a nutritional supplement. It's taken in the diet. It's obviously treated the same as any other nutrient in the diet. It's trying to understand how digestion impacts on the ability of these selenium yeast products to function. Um, and this is um, some work from, from Sheena Fagan in Dunboyne, looking at a proteomics-based approach to understanding these differences. And this is just simple uh, relative abundance work where we can show differences in the overall pr uh, protein profiles of these different selenium yeast products. Some are more similar to others, as you can see by the clustering here, uh, but certainly one that does stand out uh, is our product. And again, probably a chance uh, um, uh, um, use of a yeast product. Um, we wouldn't have anticipated 20, 25 years back that choice of yeast will be as critical as it is to uh, the functioning of uh, um, these selenium yeast products. But certainly, when you look at uh, the profile differences, there are distinct differences between them. Sheena has done some, some very nice work. This is a, um, a, a poultry-based model of digestion where she's seen completely different digestion profiles and completely different release of selenium metabolite markers. We've just used selenium methionine as a metabolite marker in this case, but if you look at, at the uh, relative abundance of all those other selenium metabolites that are present, um, so from Patrick Ward's work, you can see that, or you could at least anticipate that the release of these during digestion will be completely different. And that, we believe, is one of the reasons why we see those differences between selenium yeast products. The proteins that have those selenium amino acids and selenium amino acid analogs in them are digested differently with different release and different conversion. And again, this just shows the before and after effect. It's a, a PCA analysis, basically, before digestion. You can see that if you were to look at um, the proteins before digestion, they cluster quite uh, similar. There are differences between them, but they do seem to look uh, um, quite similar. Following the digestion, however, extremely different or different profiles. And that, we believe, is the basis behind the ability of um, our selenium yeast product uh, to enhance those uh, cellular activities or enhance the antioxidant uh, um, function within the cell. So uh, I think when you think about selenium and, and how for many years it was viewed as a toxic element, I think it's quite clear now when we look at the work we've done over the last number of years that the form in which the mineral is presented is key to its safety and its toxicity. Um, and you'd have to wonder, is it a selenium effect or is it a selenium compound effect? I actually think it's more of a selenium compound effect or more of a, 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 um, the ability of all of those selenium metabolites to act in concert. Um, and perhaps that's why it has, or it is noted as a, an anti-cancer prophylactic. And that, just finally on the selenium side, takes me uh, quite nicely to Ali Coyle's work in the NICB, where we're looking at uh, pancreatic-based uh, uh, um, cancers. Uh, and what Ali has shown uh, more recently, again, is the difference in terms of the ability of different selenium products uh, um, to regulate, in this case, here, viability. So we're looking at distinct differences between uh, sodium selenite uh, in two different uh, pancreatic uh, uh, um, cancer models, uh, rather than either the placebo or the selenium yeast. So there are distinct differences in terms of the bioavailability of these uh, products, um, in this case to uh, pancreatic, pancreatic uh, cancers. I think George did get it right when he said that uh, science is always wrong. It never solves a problem without creating 10 more. It's a good headache to have. Um, we, we've taken I guess a, a good approach towards understanding those differences between selenium source and with the help of, of, of different groups at DCU and certainly does form a, a really good foundation for us to build on and, and move forward with. Um, just switching very quickly towards uh, copper um, and this is I guess is the, the big project that we have here at DCU with uh, um, and Martin and the team in NSCB is to try and understand differences that exist between different sources of copper. 
Um, and typically, when, we, 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 when I'm talking about copper supplementation, I'm looking at livestock and poultry. But we'll see the same cellular impacts uh, for our cells that, uh, that we do with livestock and poultry as well. Uh, it's important to remember that we're, I guess our, our nutritional concepts that we use are based on 1960s and 1970s data. So the trace for mineral requirements of livestock and poultry back then were distinctly different. Um, um, poultry was smaller, uh, they had different requirements, different growth rates, and different requirements for, for, for trace elements and minerals, the same with larger animals. Um, so certainly uh, over the last number of years we've seen developments whereby we're moving away from so-called inorganic mineral salts, so copper sulphate, uh, copper chloride, or iron sulphate, iron chloride for instance, and moving to, more towards um, chelated uh, trace elements, so chelated transition elements. Um, People often say, well, you know, why don't you just add more? And the fact of the matter is, there are a lot of mineral interactions and antagonisms that we need to be careful with. Um, certainly, inorganics have reduced biological activity compared to some of those uh, um, more bioavailable chelated compounds, but there are significantly very strong environmental concerns to take into account. So the use of trace elements and minerals in, in poultry and livestock production is very, very tightly regulated by the European Food Safety Authority. Um, and because of a lot of environmental concerns, uh, they've significantly reduced those limits over the last number of years. But more significantly, what we're seeing now are um, uh, moves towards even greater reductions based on the ability of trace elements to co-select for antibiotic resistance. So environmental antibiotic resistance is a significant concern in um, livestock and in poultry production systems. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we're not simply just adding more inorganics to allow um, the uh, meat producing animals that we eat uh, grow faster. And if you were to ask me, well, you know, why even bother chelate uh, trace elements? The main reason behind this is to make them more bioavailable. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is the impact of changing pH conditions in the gastrointestinal tract on the stability uh, and on the reactivity of different transition elements like copper, iron, zinc, and manganese. So regardless of species, there's a constant flux or a constant change in pH within the GI tract of um, the various species that are listed here. Um, so you're going from neutral to extremely acidic back up to neutral again. You really need to be able to withstand those constant changes in pH to be bioavailable. So trace elements and minerals are taken up in um, the upper reaches of the small intestine. That's where they need to be delivered in an intact form. In terms of uh, the feed industry's use of so-called chelated minerals, so we're making use now of, I guess, coordination chemistry, and there are many different products on the marketplace. Um, so a lot of these will either be classed as complexes or chelates, and they'll use different bonding groups to react with the transition element, whether it's copper, iron, zinc, or manganese. So they'll either use amino acids, they can use short-chain peptides, which is the type of product that we manufacture, or you can use polysaccharides or organic acids as well to interact with um, the trace element and deliver that in a more bioavailable form. There is a lot of confusion in the industry, and again, the same with uh, the different selenium yeast products. What we've been challenged with is to try and understand why our product is a better bet, why our product is a safer bet for use in poultry and livestock production. And that's where um, the NICB has been instrumental uh, in, in working with us over the last number of years. Um, just as an aside, and I mentioned at the start about how tightly regulated um, um, the use of mineral nutrition is in poultry and livestock production. Uh, we've worked with the European Fid Food Safety Authority on this, Central Reference Laboratory, in developing control mechanisms or control assays to demonstrate um, chelation in these products. And this is um, a paper from uh, earlier this year where we use a combination of either FTIR or powder X-ray diffraction to show uh, the true extent of chelation in the products and demonstrate that they are what they say they are. A lot of what we've done has been modelling work. Um, we've, we've worked extensively with um, Professor Mike Hines at NUI Galway, looking at trying to understand how the type of bonding group you use impacts on the stability of the different um, complexes or the different chelates you can manufacture. And I've just given some work here. This is a combination of a few different uh, um, um, 
authors uh, uh, work, including work from um, the team in Dunboyne. But certainly when you look at the type of bonding group you use, you can have a very, very significant impact on the stability of those uh, complexes and chelates. Um, and you can see when you compare, uh, I've just listed glycine here as a reference marker, compare glycine with these dipeptides you get a sense straight away that there are distinct differences in terms of the strength of bond between the bonding group and between those uh, um, um, different minerals. And historically, uh, I think organic trace minerals were considered to be or were compared based on the size of bonding group. But certainly when you look at this type of data here, you can see that it really isn't size, it's the type of bonding group and uh, that's of more importance. I mentioned that we work with uh, peptide-based uh, chelates. Uh, and it's quite simple. Um, all we do is we take a large protein source, we hydrolyze it in a specific fashion. This generates uh, smaller uh, chain peptides, but significantly the sequence of those peptides uh, changes. So by using different combinations of proteases and peptidases, you can manufacture um, optimal, if you like, hydrolysates, which will bond mineral in a much more stable fashion and then obviously enable the delivery of that mineral in a much more bioavailable form, which means that you can get over those environmental concerns and the negative interactions and toxicities. This is uh, from work from the Rand Byrne, again, just showing how the hydrolysis impacts on pH dependent stability. This is, I guess, a simplified uh, version of it, but you can see that uh, by manipulating the hydrolysis, you can begin to manipulate the acidic stability of these coordination uh, um, 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 products. Uh, and certainly this is the type of approach that we take during manufacturing to try and understand how a simple twist can make a much better product or make a much more stable product. Something that's, I guess, of, of interest to us, um, and it'll become of interest to um, anybody who uses vitamin E over the next while, is how different trace mineral products will interact with um, different feed components. Um, if anybody doesn't know, there is uh, an issue at the moment with production and supply of vitamin E that's significantly impacting on prices, um, and they've actually gone up by about fivefold in the last month alone, and they're projected to go even uh, higher over the next couple of, of weeks. The same with vitamin A, um, and that's down to fires in plants that produce precursors of the actual molecule. Where we're interested in is how different uh, trace elements or different forms of a trace element, whether it's copper, iron, zinc, or manganese, will interact with different uh, feed components. So whether that's enzymes, whether that's antioxidants, whether that's vitamins, uh, it's an area that's of, of significant uh, interest to us. Just given some examples here, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but we can show different impact of different types of trace mineral products and oxidation processes. In this case here, it's quite a simple in vitro model, just looking at how different coordination complexes um, can significantly reduce the effect of, in this case, BHT in preventing oxidation. And we also see it with enzyme levels as well, or enzyme activity can be significantly impacted by different uh, forms of the same trace element. And I guess we were quite limited in what we could do um, internally over in Dunboyne, and that's why we've, we've worked with um, Martin's group at DCU here at NICB to try and understand how those different forms of, of, of uh, copper, for instance, can impact at a cellular level. Um, and that's led to the development of the NICB collaboration, which has been uh, um, greatly supported by Enterprise Ireland uh, through an innovation partnership. And the aim of this is to try and gain an understanding of the impact of organic and inorganic minerals uh, in the intestine. Um, uh, President McCrae uh, alluded to a paper um, uh, at the start uh, during the introduction. Um, he must have read my mind because I... <laughs> I have this up here, so this, is, this was a, a lead author on this, was Finbar Sullivan at the NICB. It's very much a, a team-based approach, but it's great to, to see that uh, it's been recognised as uh, one of the first papers, or the first paper to use uh, a triomics-based approach. And I really think it's only through the use of this type of, uh, of approach, rather than looking at uh, um, transcriptomics or rather than looking at proteomics in isolation, that you can begin to understand the very, very complex nature of these interactions at a cellular level. Um, this is from a paper that, that Joanne Keenan is, is, is just about to publish. Um, what we're doing here is we're comparing different copper sources. Um, and if you were to look at this, um, and we're looking at the impact of 
or the uptake rather of four different forms of copper in two different cell lines, you'd say, well, yeah, okay, they're, so they're fairly, you know, fairly constant. We see the same uptake um, in those cell lines with the same compound. Surely they must be the same. Um, they're actually not. And when you begin to look at the um, cellular processes or the cellular impacts, you can start to see the distinct differences. And you can start to see the distinct impacts at a malnutrition level of these different copper sources. I guess one of the, the, the first impacts that, that Joanne looked at was how, um, or look for the difference in terms of uh, long-term and short-term uh, ROS generation, or reactive oxygen species generation, which is a marker of oxidative damage, if you like, within these cells. Basically what she's seen is that when you look at um, the MHA-based product rather than a peptide-based product, there are differences in terms of the longevity of that response. So you get a much more sustained response with the copper MHA-based product than you do with the uh, proteinate-based product or the peptide-based product. So even though the cellular uptake levels are the same, you have a different impact at a cellular level. I think we were probably most surprised um, by this, or the most surprising aspect of this was how little uh, change we saw at a proteomic level. We probably would have anticipated a far greater response at a proteomic level, given the impact um, with the uh, uh, sustained reactive oxygen species. Uh, but certainly, uh, um, when we drill down into it, you only need a minor change in protein levels, or minor changes at a proteomic level, to have a, a far greater um, detrimental impact at a cellular level. Um, and what Joanne has shown is that when you look at the copper MHA-based product, which had that sustained uh, ROS release, you actually see a greater impact on the redox state of the cell. And that's nicely demonstrated here by the uh, proteomic markers that, uh, that Joanne has looked at. And in fact, when you drill down into it further, what we see is that there's a much greater impact on the redox state of the cell by this form of um, um, chelated copper than we see with other forms of it. And in fact, some of the results that we saw uh, have shown that there are impacts at the prote proteosomal level um, with much more greater uh, misfolding of proteins and in fact um, striking agrosomal formation with the copper MHA-based product, again alluding to the toxicity of it relative to uh, other forms of uh, um, um, copper. So that, I guess, brings me to some of the final points on this. When you look at copper, is it an essential nutrient or an unwanted uh, um, malnutrient? And certainly it's down, I think, to the form in which you are taking that copper in your diet. So uh, I'd urge you all to have a look at um, the label on those trace elements and mineral supplements that you perhaps might take. And, <coughs> and certainly look at a form in which you probably guarantee that you're going to get much reduced impact at a cellular level, much reduced uh, oxidative stress. Final comment on that, not all sources are created equal. So you can have an essential nutrient which can turn into an unwanted malnutrient. Um, so ultimately, I think what the main findings that we've had from the uh, um, NICB collaboration here is that form really does define function. Uh, simple changes in the form in which a mineral is presented can have very dramatic cellular impacts. Uh, you can have nutritional, but you can also have malnutritional effects. And that's been important for us. Um, it's been a, a, a very good way to present our product in a different light to competitor products. Uh, it is a, a crowded market space. Certainly, if you go up to Holland and Barrett, you could see 14, 15, even more different branded products on sale. Uh, you'll see the same on the animal side as well. Uh, and finally, um, I am a fan of Urban Shargaff. You'll have noticed a common theme throughout this. Uh, uh, even though we've come as far as we have with the, the collaboration with, with the NICB and the collaboration with DCU in a number of different levels, I think really science is wonderfully equipped to answer the question how, uh, but when it, gets, it does get terribly confused when you ask the question why. And that's what we hope to understand over the next while is why we see these impacts, get a greater understanding of of uh, um, how these different forms of trace elements can have such dramatic impacts. Finally, just to mention all the contributors and collaborators, um, there are a significant number here from DCU. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the funding that we've gotten from Enterprise Ireland and from the Irish Research Council and from the IDA as well. Um, I think it's great to see uh, support for industry university collaborations being given uh, and hopefully we can uh, continue on our journey as well. Thank you.